ಓಂ ಸಹನಾವತು ಸಹನೌ ಭುನಕ್ತು ಸಹ ವೀರ್ಯನ್ಖರವಾವಹೈ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿನಾವಧೀತಮಸ್ತು ಮಾವ್ಯದ್ವಿಷಾವಹೈ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಓಂ ವೆರಿ ಗುಡ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ಇನ್ ಅರ್ ನ್ಯೂ ಜರ್ಸಿ ಆಶ್ರಮ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಟು ದಿ ಮೆನಿ ಸ್ಟೂಡೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಅಟೆಂಡಿಂಗ್ ದಿ ಸಟ್ ಸಾಂಗ್ಸ್ ಆನ್ ಲೈನ್ ಇಸ್ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಟು ಗೆಟ್ ಆಲ್ ಯುರ್ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ what we'll do today as we've done in past weeks is we'll take both questions that have been submitted by online uh students and then alternate with questions from our our local students okay we'll start with a question from shiv doesn't say where he lives shiv he asks the absolute brahman um is the true self knowing that why do we still have to carry this body mind package around <laughs> a interesting way of putting it if you are brahman why bother with this body mind thing why do you have to carry it around and the key in his question by the way is knowing he says if you know that you are brahman why do you have to carry this body and mind around well the very fact that that question is being asked suggests that brahman is not known because when brahman is known brahman doesn't you know that brahman doesn't carry <laughs> anything around brahman just is brahman your true nature gives existence to everything gives existence to your body and mind but not that it has to be carried around there's nothing to carry brahman doesn't have to do anything this is um an indicator of of a deeper problem let me talk about it very briefly and that is to say my true self is brahman for most people is not a statement of knowledge it's a statement of belief You heard it from many scriptures. You've heard it from me. Scriptures seem reliable. I seem reliable, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> And you assume it to be true. Yeah, if if the Upanishad says it, if Swamiji says it, then it must be true. I am Brahman. That is not self-knowledge. that is a belief of course it's a helpful belief because if you don't believe you'll never get to knowledge we start with belief and we go towards knowledge you know, in bhagavad gita shri shri krishna says shraddhavan labhate gnanam very important statement shraddhavan one who has shraddha labhate gains gnanam knowledge knowledge in the sense of discovery of your true nature so you start off with a belief it's good if you don't believe <laughs> you know if if you say hey, what is it, what the scriptures say is ridiculous what swamiji says is more ridiculous so then how will you gain moksha if that is your initial conclusion so we start with belief shrad and belief in a sense of shraddha in advaita vedanta we have a very particular definition of shraddha and that is faith or trust pending personal verification so that kind of belief that kind of faith is good that's our starting point so you hear it from the scriptures you hear it in class and we begin there but that's not where we end the conclusion then is you begin with scriptures say i am brahman and then the conclusion which follows a process of personal self inquiry that is looking into your own experience 
looking into your own mind, the relationship between you and your thoughts, and through that process of self-inquiry, Atma Vichara, through that process, you have to discover for yourself the truth of that statement. It's a little bit like in science, you make a hypothesis, and then you have to prove it. You have to, you have to establish or substantiate the truth of that hypothesis. So take it as when you say, I am Brahman, from the scriptures or from the class, take that as a hypothesis. But you have to personally confirm, validate, verify the truth of that statement. Okay, this is a question from Shiv. Next is a question from Arun. Arun lives in Bengaluru. And he asks, there are many different commentaries on the Bhagavad Gita by many authors. And he makes an interesting observation here that they, they come from different schools of Vedanta, um, recognizing that every commentary has its own slant. And in fact, the modern term is spin. So every commentary has its own spin. Shankara puts a non-dual spin on the teachings of, of the Bhagavad Gita. Ramanuja and Madhva put their own spins on the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita. We, that's to be expected. Um, and the classic example, of course, is the founder of the Hare Krishna movement, this very pious Swami Prabhupada, wrote his famous commentary on the Bhagavad Gita. That's fine, but then he named it Bhagavad Gita as it is. That's where the problem is. The problem is not his commentary. The problem is the claim <laughs> that this commentary doesn't put a spin on the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita, which is what that as it is suggests. Every commentary puts a spin on it. Every teacher puts his or her own spin on it, including me. I, I won't deny, to, to deny that would be silly. So how to choose, and, and, this, and what uh, Arun's question is, how to choose the best commentary for me. And that's very simple. If, if you are devoted to Swami Prabhupada, <laughs> then his commentary is best for you. On the other hand, if you are inclined towards the non-dual teachings of Advaita Vedanta, then Shankara's commentary is the best. But there's a li even there, there's a little problem. Shankara's commentary is in scholarly Sanskrit, and when it's translated into English, I would say 75% of the meaning gets lost. That's because it's scholarly. If you translate something simple, you can more or less maintain the essence of it. But when you translate a scholarly work, better expect to lose a lot. So therefore, the, uh, even to study uh, Shankara's commentary, is, if you're not, if you don't know Sanskrit is a tough goal, which is why we have all these classes. So in my classes on the Bhagavad Gita, um, actually in the prior C series of classes on Bhagavad Gita, I've used uh, Shankara's commentary quite extensively, although not teaching the commentary itself. One more, uh, we'll take one more question here, but before we move on, another suggestion, if you want an elaborate con uh, commentary in English, comprehensible English, which means not like, not like a translation of Shankara's commentary, but if you want an English commentary that is very true to the teachings of Advaita Vedanta, Many of you know that my guru's uh, teachings on Bhagavad Gita are available in, I think, what is it, nine, nine books? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, a, um, it's an actually an edited transcript 
of classes he gave over a period of two years. So you get a two-year daily study contained in these books. It's a fantastic work if you want that kind of detailed uh, commentary on the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, Swami Dayananda's, my, my guru's uh, commentary, would definitely be recommended. Okay, one more question here. And this is from, this is from Neil who lives in Atlanta, Georgia. How do we maintain presence of mind when it comes to Vedantic wisdom? How do we always keep Vedantic knowledge at the forefront of our minds so that our actions are always guided by it? That's an excellent question and points to Another one of these fundamental issues with, with Vedanta. First of all, isn't it unrealistic to keep these teachings in the forefront of your mind all the time? I am Brahman, I am Brahman, I am Brahman. You get a phone call, I am Brahman, I am Brahman. <laughs> You're with your spouse, I am Brahman. <laughs> you know, there's something wrong with that. By the way, that's kind of a technique associated with this positive thinking that you have to go on really repeating these uh, teachings to keep them very, very much present in your mind. And frankly, that's, it's not realistic. Nor is it desirable, nor is it possible. Let's take those two things. First of all, it's not um, desirable because it's not enough. <laughs> you know, if, if, if you're trying to convince yourself, I am Brahman, I am Brahman, and then you, you discover that a huge investment you made is now worth zero, happens, <laughs> and you tell yourself, I am Brahman, will that I am Brahman work at that moment in time? You just get this news, that your investment is now worthless. What happens to I am Brahman? Evaporates, right? It just evaporates. If it's something you're repeating, it's not very strong. That's why you have to repeat it. And this really shows a fundamental issue with regard to Advaita Vedanta. We say Vedanta is all about self-knowledge. Self-knowledge is knowledge of your true nature as, as Atma. And you, you've heard me joke before, self-knowledge is not something you have to remind yourself of again and again. And the joke I've given is when you wake up in the morning, do you have to go to the mirror and remind yourself of who you are? is totally unnecessary. You know who you are 24, not 24 seven, whenever you're awake, including when you get that uh, notice that your, your, uh, your uh, investment uh, became worthless. You know who you are. That knowledge doesn't come and go. Oh, I think it's that microphone, yeah. That knowledge doesn't come and go your knowledge of who you are is part of your world view. Your world view doesn't come and go. What's present in your mind at a particular point in time comes and goes. But your basic understanding of who you are and your relationship to the world, your world view doesn't come and go, it abides. When your world view is I am an individual being trying to understand enough Vedanta so that nothing affects me in life. And for that reason, I go on saying I am Brahman, I am Brahman, I am Brahman, trying to ward off suffering and conflict in life. That worldview, it's not enough. <laughs> it simply isn't enough. The goal of Vedanta is not reached through telling yourself again and again, I am Brahman, I am Brahman, or trying to hold on to anything. Anything you 
Yeah. Anything you hold on to can be dropped. Correct? So if you're holding on to your enlightenment, in quotation marks, then that's something that's easily dropped. Enlightenment is not holding on to anything. Enlightenment, as the language I've used before, it is a complete transformation of your worldview, where you shift the way you see yourself, you shift the way you see the world. It is a permanent shift. It is nothing you have to remind yourself about. Any, as I said, anything you hold on to can be dropped. This is not something you hold on to. Okay, why don't we take a, who has a question uh, here in the hall? Raise your hand, in, ba in back. Make sure the microphone is up. Yeah, please. Um, <coughs> this is a follow-up on a question from last week that um, I loved your answer, but um, it was, it was brought up some thoughts in my mind, and it was looking at um, the uh, religions, all the religions, and how if there, there's some commonality. Um, my question, the question that came up in my mind was, um, what was it about um, the society or culture that the Vedanta came up in with um, uh, as opposed to the, the Western Abrahamic religions? came, is, was there something that made it more, um, that, that, that those, those teachings would, would come into society as opposed to in Western society where the teachings are, are not mm -hmm. accepted? Okay. I don't know. <laughs> that, that would be a, a good question for an anthropologist. If I understand your question correctly, it's how does the culture in which a religion evolves, how does that culture affect the religion that evolves in that culture? And cr I, I agree with you completely. There sh must be some effect, absolutely. Um, how a Hindu tradition varies from these other traditions, and it's significant how different they are. Here's an observation which I think is really incomplete. It's been said many times that Judaism, Christianity, Islam, coming up in the Middle East, this was a um, very tribal society uh, thousands of years ago, or tribes. And early on, every tribe had its own god. So there was our tribal god, there was your tribal god, etc., etc. And many religious scholars and anthropologists think that that tribal culture had something to do with the religions that evolved there. <sighs> Ancient India, and, and the reason I, I think this analysis is insufficient is you can't say that there was a complete absence of tribal culture in ancient India. I think any ancient culture had elements of that tribalism. But apparently there was something different. And honestly, I don't know. I don't have an answer to your question. But definitely the religions to evolve from ancient Indian culture are so utterly unlike those that evolved in the um, Middle East. And I don't know why, but if you, if you trace the history, so the, um, the pr predecessor of what we call Hinduism today evolved maybe three, 4,000 years ago in India. It wasn't called even Hinduism at that time. From that tradition, several religions evolved. One is a religion we now call Hinduism. Another is the, the Jain religion, Jaina uh, tradition. Another is Buddhism. And these three religions, Sikhism came much later, but all of these have so much in common and, and so much difference 
from these Middle Eastern religions. And honestly, I, I'm, I don't have an answer for you, except to say that it's a, East is, what is, what is it? East is east, east, and e east is east, west is west, and never the twain shall meet. <laughs> was, was that, um, who, who's? I, I don't, I don't know. Anyway, it's some. <laughs> That's what's happening right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. East, East is meeting the West. Okay, another question here. Uh, you had, had a question. Microphone, please. Stefan uh, Jim. So uh, I want to ask uh, about uh, uh, many spiritual traditions, um, uh, theosophical uh, schools, uh, theological schools, and philosophers talk about that. Uh, uh, kind of the role of the human being is to kind kind of uh, divinize the mind and make the divine consciousness shine through this world. And uh, I want to ask in the context of Sri Aurobindo's works. So his main uh, emphasis was that uh, like only moksha is not enough, like liberation and self-realization. So the higher objective is to uh, kind of ma uh, become the vessel uh, for divine to shine in this world. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about this? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> the teachings of Sri Aurobindo are unique for a very important reason. He was referred to as a rishi. Rishi means, a rishi is one, the technical definition of a rishi, by the way, is Kranta Darshi. One who can see beyond, one who can see what others can't see. And we, we, the rishis of ancient India are those who had this unique ability to recognize certain truths and put them together into verses, which we now study as the Vedas. So this is the revelation of the ancient rishis. Aurobindo can be considered a rishi, which means his revelation is not the same as the revelation of the ancient rishis, the ancient sages. So he, and this is not a criticism, this is an observation. In fact, some people will look upon this as, as a, a, a matter of praise. He went beyond the Hindu tradition. Raised in the Hindu tradition, um, I think, if I remember right, the story goes that he was uh, jailed for many years during the freedom struggle, and he got enlightened in jail. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Time well spent. <laughs> <laughs> Nelson Mandela got his law degree <laughs> while he was in jail. So ja going to jail is not necessarily a bad thing. Gandhi spent a long time <laughs> in jail. Anyway. <coughs> so Aurobindo, in jail, maybe, I don't know if it was in Calcutta or where, but uh, he, his teachings are unique and highly personal and not necessarily in conformance with what uh, the Upanishads taught. We would say that he goes... Some, someone who likes Aurobindo would say he goes beyond the Upanishads, and someone who is not fond of Aurobindo would say he goes against <laughs> the Upanishads. And both are accurate, depends, depends on your, your point of view. Um, <coughs> to answer your question is, is a little, I don't know how to answer your question. I'm, I'm not a follower of Aurobindo. I've read some of his works. I guess it didn't grab me, I didn't enjoy it. By the way, <coughs> Aurobindo is difficult to study. Uh, if it, it just, he was a, um, I think he, he uh, bef before he went to jail, I think he had a degree in, in English literature, I think. So he was, he was very scholarly. And, and yeah, I think that's correct. English literature was his, uh, was his, 
his uh, degree. And as a result, I remember reading, <coughs> I don't recall, it was decades ago, reading some of his works. He would start a paragraph at the top of, a, I'm sorry, he would start a sentence at the top of a page. The sentence would end halfway down the page. I, yeah, just very scholarly thinking. Of course, that means he had a lot of um, scholarly power with him. And I would say more than scholarly power, a lot of insight, a lot of crea creative insights. Um, and one thing that seemed to permeate his thought is the idea of evolution, that we are constantly growing and growing and growing. Very honestly, that goes contrary, completely contrary, to the teachings of Advaita Vedanta. Um, it suggests that Atma needs to grow, Atma needs to transform, Atma needs to go further, and um, that's highly problematic uh, in, the, in the light of Advaita Vedanta. Um, how, how he reconciled what it is that advances, what it is that evolves, I don't know because I haven't studied him thoroughly enough, so I really can't give you a, an a Boy, I'm, I'm striking out twice now, <laughs> in the sense of not being able to answer your questions. So anyway, do you want to follow up on that? I didn't give you much to go on. Go ahead. OK. OK, um, one more question here, over here, please. Yes, please. Nam Namaste, Swamiji. So uh, we talk about uh, Brahman being without any attributes, and yet we, uh, our aim is uh, to have the attributes of all the divine, or try to strive for all the uh, all loving, all uh, giving, uh, non-judgmental attributes of the divine. So uh, would you say that we are? transcending from the attributes to the attributeless? Hmm. Um, good, thank you for your, your question. Let me try to address that. And I, think, I think this one I, I can address, <laughs> hopefully. It's, if it doesn't have to do with anthropology and it doesn't have to do with Sri Aurobindo, maybe I'll do a, do a little better here. Um, you said that our goal is to acquire attributes of divinity. Yes. That's not exactly what the ancient rishis taught. The ancient rishis said, you're already divine, right? You're already divine. In fact, there are fam the famous Mahavakya, tat tvam asi, you are that. You already are that. Therefore, you are, you, it's not that you become divine, and this is, again, where, where Advaita Vedanta and Aurobindo would probably uh, disagree on this particular point. You don't become divine, you don't grow in divinity, you already are that. My guru had very simple, nice language. You already have that which you want to possess. You already are that which you want to become. And that's really what the ancient Rishi has said. tat you are that. They never said you will become that. In fact, the process of becoming and growth is part of samsara. That which, by the way, that which grows dies. <laughs> Is it not so? That which is that which is subject to growth is subject to decay and death. We know that very well, <laughs> too well. <laughs> so it's it's problematic to say that our goal in spiritual life is to acquire these spiritual attributes, as you call them, or to become divine or to become more divine. That's not how the ancient rishis envisioned this, pr this process, nor is it how Sri Krishna taught it in the Bhagavad Gita. 
um, what Sri Krishna taught, Arjuna, and what the ancient rishis taught, is you have to discover. If your true nature is already divine, have you discovered that for yourself? And as we, we discussed in the prior question, it's not a matter of, oh yes, uh, rishis say my true nature is already divine. That kind of information is almost useless, helpful at the beginning. The goal is to discover for yourself what about you is already divine, has always been divine, and will always be divine. This is something to be discovered. That discovery, I think, uh, characterizes a life of, of spiritual growth. So if we use this term spiritual growth, what does that mean to grow? As, as I just joked with you, anything that grows <laughs> decays and dies. We use that expression, but the intent of that expression is to say we grow in wisdom. We grow in terms of understanding more and more vividly our true nature, as to use Vedantic language, Satchitananda, Atma. Uh, do you want to follow up on that? Uh, no, I think that is clear. I guess what I was thinking is more about purification of the mind rather than the discovery of the true self. Okay, so uh, purification of the mind is growth. Decays and dies. <laughs> <laughs> purification of the mind is important but not as the goal. Purification of the mind is not the goal, it's a means to the end. The purpose of purifying your mind is to be able to discover your true nature as yes. such Ananda. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Let's take some more questions uh, from our online viewers. Let's see here. This is... Amit. Amit lives in India. He asks, what is your view on divination tools like astrology, numerology, Akashic record readings? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, some of our, our students here are laughing because they know my response <laughs> already. <laughs> okay. Um, and he, he uh, amid comments that there's, you know, this numer numerology and Akashic records have nothing to do with the ancient rishis, but astrology we have some basis for in, in, ancient, uh, in ancient scriptures. And the question is, can we use astrology and other tools like this to identify our karmas and patterns which bind us and, and, help and overcome them? overcome these strong, I'm kind of paraphrasing, um, or in your view, is it a hindrance to spiritual growth? Interesting that Amit picks up on that. So let, let's, let's try to talk about it. First of all, if you ask, what is my view on, just limit to astrology, I think, for our discussion. If you ask about numerology, all this other kooky stuff, I don't think we need to discuss. Um, astrology is something we should discuss. If you ask me, does astrology work? Jyotish Shastra, we call it Shastra, uh, scriptural science. So is, does, it, does it work or does it not? And this is another area where <laughs> I'm not trained, <laughs> so I, I can't say conclusively it works or it doesn't work. One thing I can say conclusively, without any doubt, is whether or not astrology works, we know for sure that many astrologers are useless. <laughs> That's just a fact. Astrology may, could be something very powerful, but it's only powerful if it's used effectively. And f as far as I know, a great number of astrologers do not seem very accurate or skillful or helpful. That's just my impression from talking to so many people who have consulted astrologers. So 
I think it's of very limited utility. But no, let's pick up, he men mentioned this, is it a, a hindrance to spiritual growth? Do you know, there's an interesting problem that occurs when we get fixated, we doesn't mean you in particular, but when people get, um, fa first of all, fascination with how does karma work. We'll broaden the topic a little bit, a little bit right here. There are so many people who are fascinated. What happened in my past life? How did that affect me in this life? What will happen in my next life? The people in my lives, have we lived before together? There are just endless questions. And I, you know, we, we understand these are natural questions, but please tell me, what do they have to do with spiritual growth? Honestly, nothing. It's a whole side issue. You're trying to figure out what's going on in your life. Well, do you... What's the point? You already know that life goes like this, whether it goes like this because of the position of Jupiter or Saturn or whatever it is, Shani. So whether, whether you, your life is ups and downs, whether it's up and down because of these planetary deities or not, does it make any difference? So if you're down, you're down. If it's because of this Shani Dasha or not, what difference does it make? <laughs> down <laughs> is down. And that's a natural part of life. Now here's, a, if you fixate your attention on why am I so down, is that helpful? It's like, hmm, this is kind of a harsh metaphor. Someone has hurt you and you become fixated on that person. Is that helpful? In fact, it's harmful. And I'm afraid that happens with some people who are drawn in to understand this, this doctrine of karma. Why is this happening to me? And what did I do to deserve this? And all of this, it's, it's not helpful. Um, further, it's all, of, it's, uh, it's all at a very worldly level like science analyzes the world. We could say that astrology is a non-scientific way of trying to analyze life. Um, but life, worldly life, I thought spiritual growth is to transcend worldly life. So when, when Amit says, or is it your view that this can be a, a um, hindrance to spiritual growth, I think for some people, it truly is. It directs your attention in directions which are not helpful. You get fixated, you get fixated on the problems and the causes for your problems instead of coming out of those problems, which is a more Vedantic uh, solution. Uh, Amit concludes, can we leverage such tools for spiritual and material progress? Can you leverage astrology for material progress? If your astrologer is accurate, maybe. <laughs> but I don't know, if you seek your astrologer before going into the stark stock market, good luck. I, I, I don't know how well that would work, but again, depends on the astrologer perhaps. But can we leverage such tools for spiritual growth? I really think it's more of a distraction in, in almost every <coughs> case than, than I hope. Okay, uh, that's a Mitz question. This is a question from Revati, who lives in Bangalore. And she asks, what is subconscious mind? The word subconscious is not a direct translation of any Sanskrit term. This is a Western concept. 
In fact, if I remember right, this concept was kind of invented by Freud and then developed uh, by later generations of, of psychologists. <coughs> um, subconscious mind, as the word says, it's an aspect of your mind that you're not conscious of. Like what? Well, memories. Memories are technically, they're in your mind, but you're not aware of them. Um, you know, tendencies, in, in Sanskrit we call them vasanas and samskaras. These in, inner inclinations, they become manifest, but most of the time they are below the level of consciousness. So there, and e the term consciousness here is a psychological usage of the term. So subconscious means that which you're, conscious here means that which you are aware of. So that these are items in your mind you're not aware of. Um, we don't, you know, F Freud and Jung and boy, they go very, very deep analyses of how, especially events in early childhood affect us later in life. And some of it is extremely powerful. Some of it is, I think there's a, a, I'd like to suggest a problem. First of all, psychology, in my view, is for people who have psychological difficulties. There are psycholog psychological therapies which can be extremely effective. So I have great respect for psychology as a therapy. For young, Psychology was not a therapy. For Jung, psychology was a uh, philosophy. And that's, to me, that's not as helpful. And I think because great, you know, he, he was a great man, it was Carl, Carl Jung. And he used this, this, these ideas of, uh, of subconscious a lot in his teachings. But it again looks like another detour. You're getting, you're getting stuck with your mind. You're getting infatuated with your mind. Um, let, let, let me try to make this very clear. Psychology as therapy for psychological problems, excellent. But psychology used to try to understand every little detail of your mind and resolve every little conflict in your mind can lead to a kind, an obsession with your own mind. This happens, and to be very honest, I think spiritual seekers are perhaps more subject to this particular obsession, like the spiritual seeker sitting in this chair <laughs> was extremely obsessed with his mind, and it was a problem, a huge problem. I was so intro, I mean, being introspective is an essential part of the process of spiritual growth, but anything can be taken to an unhealthy extreme, and I did that. It doesn't help, it doesn't work. And just to, to, to wrap this up, um, an anecdote I've shared with you before, but is really meaningful, is when after several years of studying Vedanta with my guru in daily classes during our three-year course, I went to him almost in tears and said, Swamiji, when is my mind going to settle down? And he said, when you stop worrying about your mind so much. <laughs> and he, he nailed it. He nailed it. He knew I was unnecessarily focused on the condition of my mind. We have a word for that with the body. There are people who are excessively focused on the condition of their bodies, right? What is it? I, I blank out on the term. What is the term we use? Um, 
not psycho, uh, someone who is, hi, that, that's the word I'm looking for, thank you, hypochondriac. I don't know what, what hypo, I don't know. What? Why hypo? <laughs> You're the doctor. Because <laughs> hypo means low, right? <laughs> Maybe, maybe a low evaluation of the condition of your body. Yeah, yeah. Or the energy goes down. Or the, uh, what? Chondria. What is that related to? Anyway, who, who knows? Anyway, <laughs> sorry. <coughs> the, the point is, is to be obsessed with the condition of the body, of the condition of your body. How does that help you in spiritual life? Distraction, right? To be equally obsessed with the condition of your mind, like I was, equally a distraction. So, enough said about subconscious mind. The ancient rishis, they didn't use the word subconscious. They talked about um, memories. They talked about vasanas, samskaras. So they had the language, but they didn't use that term uh, subconscious. Patrick who lives in Grand Junction, Colorado, asks a question. Um, a little long, it's helpful if the questions are a little shorter. Um, is it possible that consciousness is just a private mental function of the individual brain that begins at birth and terminates at death. That is, consciousness is a product of your brain. How can we be certain that our consciousness is truly pure, unchanging, uncreated, unlimited, and all-pervasive? How, how do we know this for sure? First of all, <coughs> and this is an important question for modern times. This was not much of a question in ancient times because none of them could even imagine what the brain did. They didn't know what, and, and, and it's just strange. Until a couple hundred years ago, we didn't know that the brain was the seat of emotions. Only until what was the famous story of Phineas Gage. Do you know Phine who was Phineas Gage? This is, Maybe 200 years ago, approximately, there was a guy working on a rail railroad and pounding some dynamite with a steel rod into the ground, and the dynamite ignited, the steel rod penetrated his, his head and went through his brain. And somehow he survived. <laughs> <laughs> they took the rod out of his head, and surprisingly, you know, medical care in those days was not very good. He survived. But everyone who know Phineas said, that's not Phineas. <laughs> his personality had changed a lot. The reason I'm sharing that with you is, this is just a couple hundred years ago. Up until that time, we had no idea of the relationship between brain and mind. Surprising. 300 years ago and more, we didn't know. Now we know a lot, and we're knowing more every year. I mean, the um, uh, progress in neuroscience is just staggering, amazing. Wonderful discoveries. The discovery of neuroplasticity is one of the key findings that's important to every spiritual seeker. We won't talk about it right now, but we've, we've discussed it before. Very important findings. But all this advance in neuroscience has led to a lot of debate about whether or not consciousness is a product of the brain. There is no scientific proof that consciousness is a product of the brain. There are a gazillion theories about how the brain might cause consciousness, none of those theories are provable. What's the value of a theory that can't be proved if, or testable? 
In science, this, this ends up being a big deal. Just very quickly, uh, there was a huge debate decades ago about what's the value of this uh, string theory. That was when it was a, the latest thing. And what is the value of string theory? Many scientists were questioning its value because there's no way to test that theory. And if you can't test it, you can't prove it to be true or false. And this is a problem science has with consciousness. If science wants to prove that consciousness is produced by the brain, then science has to at least measure or detect consciousness. And philosophically and logically cannot be done. Consciousness is part of a subjective personal reality, private reality, that is available only to your own experience and is absolutely inaccessible to anyone and anything outside. This is a big philosophical issue. We won't go further with it. Anyway, the point I'm making is it's a big issue today. It is absolutely unprovable that consciousness is a product of the brain. You can any number of theories, no matter how how sexy those there may some of their theories are pretty interesting. But no matter how interesting they may be, none of those theories can prove what lies outside of the realm of science. Now that being so, how do we know? that your consciousness preceded the birth of your body and your consciousness will remain unaffected after the death of your body. How do we know for sure? And this is, this is uh, uh, Patrick's question, excellent question. So first of all, we've negated the science that says it depends on the brain. It will never be proved. You go, th go through the logic. I d it would take an hour to do that right now. I don't want to do that right now, but I promise you there's, it's, it's an easy philosophical problem to show that science can never prove that consciousness is created by the brain. That's, it's a philosophical truth. It's not hard. A freshman in college can figure this out. It's not a big deal. <coughs> So then that leaves us then, well, since science, we don't, since science can't prove, by the way, can't prove, can't disprove, right? Both, both ways. So that leaves us then, then how do we know? So what do we have at our utility? What, what resources do we have to know? One is we have scripture. We have scripture based on the teachings of the Rishis whom we believe had the ability to understand things that ordinary people like you and I can't understand. So they apparently discovered these truths, including the fact that Atma is unborn, uncreated, unchanging, as Patrick correctly said. So we have number one, we have scriptural basis, but that is absolutely not enough. Then it becomes, if it's only scripture, then it becomes a matter of blind faith. Then what, where do we go from here? Well, Shruti, Yukti, Anubhava, one of our favorite topics here. So we have scriptural support. Now what about reasoning and experience? This is where, where the other teachings of Vedanta are so important and so many of our classes are important. We use reasoning, yukti, to analyze our experience, anubhava, and in that process we can negate any challenge to consciousness being unborn, uncreated, unchanging, etc. Let me make this very clear. We cannot prove anything about Atma using reasoning and experience. Hmm. I might have to withdraw that statement. <laughs> Yeah. <sighs>
we can prove some things. We cannot prove that consciousness is unborn and uncreated. Other things we can prove, but we, there are limitations to what we can actually prove. But what we can do is any statement to the contrary, any, any contention that Atma is limited, subject to change, subject to suffering, subject to birth and death, any such contention definitely can be disproved through shruti, yukti, and anubhava. We, na we can't prove that Atma is unborn and deathless, but any argument you come up with <laughs> that says Atma was born and Atma will die, we can dismiss those, uh, those contentions. So this is how they don't, this is, uh, Patrick asked, how can we know for sure? How we know for sure is any contention to the contrary is easily dismissed. Leaving you with what? Consciousness. We discover that birth and death, everything else associated with body, mind, brain, etc., not for consciousness. Okay, take one more question here. This is Robert, who lives in Wisconsin. Um, he. How is it possible to experience Brahman as my true nature while I am subject to Maya? And there's quite a long question here, but several places we have this a reference to. How to mm -hmm. He says, how is it possible to experience Brahman as my true nature? We've discussed this in prior satsangs. You are not an object of experience. Brahman as your true nature, your true nature is consciousness, right? Set all this fancy Vedanta aside, you are a conscious being. That's a, just a simple, undeniable, self-established fact. You are a conscious being. Where Vedanta comes in, is to tell you that your consciousness is not stuck inside your head, your consciousness is not subject to birth and death. This is where Vedanta says, ultimately your consciousness is Brahman, the ultimate reality because of which everything exists. How to experience that? Everyone asks that question, not just Robert. <laughs> Everyone asks that question, how to experience Brahman? Brahman is already present in your experience as consciousness. Are you conscious? You, so somebody says, Swamiji, I think I'm not conscious. <laughs> you think. How do, how do you know you're thinking <laughs> in the first place? The, the, the point is, is that consciousness is, is, the, is the basis for all experience, it's the basis for all thinking. So consciousness is that essential aspect of who you are. <coughs> Sorry, I'm gonna, you seem to be getting tired here. We take to wrap things up shortly. <coughs> consciousness is always present in your experience. We can say in. Uh, without getting into technicalities, we can say consciousness is the content of your experience. Try that. Consci what, is ex what is experience? Experience is consciousness plus some influence from whatever you're experiencing. It's a little bit like the form of a wave. A wave is made of water, but the wave has some form. Experience is made of what? Consciousness, with, with some form. Are you having an experience right now? Yeah. The content of that experience is consciousness. 
It's never away from your experience. So the, the problem here with this question, how to experience Brahman, is due to a wrong assumption that Brahman is one more thing in the world to be known. I know this, I know that, I know so many things, now I want to know Brahman. Next. And that's turning Brahman into another worldly kind of knowledge, which just doesn't work. Okay, let me take one more question briefly, and then we'll wrap up. This is Vimalan from South Africa, <coughs> large uh, Hindu community in South Africa. Um, Advaita Vedanta teaches us that we are Brahman, eternal, limitless, blissful. Question, why did we separate from Brahman and become Jiva? Never did. <laughs> this is back to your question. Even now, you are Brahman. You don't become, it's not that you separated and have to get back. You always have been Brahman. The problem is it's not properly understood. So the problem is ignorance of your true nature as Atma, as Brahman. The problem is ignorance. The solution is knowledge. Why did Jiva start living in ignorance and not in knowledge? When you're born, are you born enlightened or <laughs> like most children with, with, with a developing brain and virtually no knowledge whatsoever. We are all born ignorant. And if you say, why are we born? Then that's into the doctrine of karma, which we don't want to discuss right now. Why did we not remain as Brahman unborn? Again, doctrine of karma. You have been, had an infinite number of prior births due to karma, and that's all driven by karma. And just to tie this up, the, uh, I think we had this discussion in our last class. So why did we separate from Brahman in the first place? This question in the first place bugs me, so to speak. <laughs> and it bugs me because it, it shows our inability to deal with the mathematical concept of infinity. Our thinking is, is like stuck. We have to expand our thinking and be able to consider the possibility that not everything has a beginning. The satsang has a beginning. Unfortunately, it'll have an end very shortly. This day has a beginning and end. Who is to say that Consciousness has a beginning. Who is to say that jiva, you as an individual being, that you have a beginning? This is a test, not test, challenge of our ability to understand what mathematicians call infinite. You have, according to the doctrine of karma, you have had an infinite number of prior lives. The consequence of that is there was no first birth. And that's a tricky concept for people to get their heads around, so to speak, but it's essential to understand that. Again, this is another place of misdirected effort. Why did I get born in the first place? What difference does it make? The problem of suffering is now, not with your first birth, which there was no first birth. So this is, um, again, our minds get drawn off track very easily. Why did we get born in the first place? What, why did I get born here? And as I joked with you before, are the people in my life today the same people I was living with in prior lives? All of this, these lines of thought are a distraction. The solution to the problem of suffering, which is what Vedanta leads us to, the solution is not found 
by thinking about what happened in the past. The solution is found only in the present. Okay, very good questions. Again, you can send me your questions. Swamiti at arshaboda.org. It's important to put satsang question in the, uh, in the subject. And we'll have more great questions next week. I'll see you next week. Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramaya Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Ma Kashchadduhka Bhagbhavet Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotirgamaya Mrityor ma amritangamaya Om shanti 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 Om Tatsat <laughs>